Hi everyone, and welcome to Open Source Summit Latin America. My name is Jillian Hall, and I am the Director of Event Content at the Linux Foundation, and we are so excited to have you here virtually. I want to first start off by saying a thank you to our sponsors, especially to our diamond sponsor, Microsoft. Also, a quick reminder about our event code of conduct. Though we are virtual, everyone will have numerous opportunities to engage and collaborate throughout the event. Please ensure you have read and abide by our code of conduct, which states that all attendees should feel safe, welcome, and included at the event. If you have any issues or witness anything during the event that violates this code of conduct, please message our event staff right away. With that, I would like to first introduce Jim Zemlin, Executive Director of the Linux Foundation. As Executive Director, Jim uses his experience to accelerate innovation and technology through the use of open source and Linux. Today, he'll be providing an update on the Linux Foundation's activities and discuss what has been an incredible year for open source around the globe. Please welcome Jim Zemlin. Hello, my name is Jim Zemlin. I'm the executive director of the Linux Foundation. And I wish I could be there in person with all of you today, uh, but we'll have to settle for a virtual convening at this point. Hopefully sometime soon, we'll be able to all get together in person. 2022 has been an amazing year so far for open source. And it really is the culmination of a long industry trend towards open source becoming a fundamental part of all technology, product, and service development. Open source has without a doubt become a cornerstone of collective innovation and of really any modern software product or service. Today, there are millions of freely available reusable components developed by millions of open source developers that enable organizations and individuals to create amazing new technology every single day. And at the Linux Foundation, we're dedicated to facilitating the development of some of the most important open source projects in the world. Linux is the project that we're best known for and our namesake, but today we have hundreds of open source projects at the Linux Foundation thousands of members and hundreds of thousands of developers working just within our communities, developing billions of dollars worth of reusable, freely available public source code that the world relies upon every single day. Our organization, although we're called uh, the Linux Foundation and our headquartered in North America, there are a few facts that you may not know about us. One is that our organization is truly global in nature. We have organizations and individuals from all over the world that contribute to our projects, participate in our organization, take training, attend events. It's safe to say the sun never sets on the Linux Foundation or the open source community. The Linux Foundation also isn't just about open source these days. Today, our organization works on some of the most important open source projects in the world, but we're also expanding into open hardware with projects such as RISC-V, one of the largest growing silicon instruction set uh, efforts in the world. We're expanding into standards development. Today, we're home to internationally recognized standards in software bill of materials data, software supply chain conformance, and much, much more. We also have open data initiatives. As machine learning and collective data become more important to our everyday lives, our organization is working on creating open data licenses and open data projects that will allow people to collaborate, not just on code, not just on hardware, but also on large data sets. In addition, the thing that a lot of folks may not know about the Linux Foundation is that we're much, much more than Linux in 2022. Today, we have efforts in different technology areas and in different industry verticals that people rely on 
constantly for their technology. In security, we're working on things like the Open Source Security Foundation, which I'll talk about later, confidential computing efforts, and more. In networking, our network organization is home to some of the most important and widely used network tools in the world. One example, our open network automation platform powers the telecommunication operators <clears throat> that provide wireless service to billions of end users. In cloud computing, I think most of you have heard of the Kubernetes project and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. You may not know that that's a part of the Linux Foundation, but indeed it is. CNCF and Kubernetes have fundamentally changed how cloud applications are built, managed, and deployed. In the automotive sector, our automotive grade Linux initiative is used to power millions of production automobiles worldwide. Web technologies such as Node.js are fundamental building blocks of modern web and mobile applications. In film, we work with the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Science, the home of the Oscars, to collaborate on CGI and visual effects software that's used to create incredible movies such as Spider-Man, Star Wars, and the Marvel movies. In the energy sector, we're working to fight climate change by working with grid operators and energy distributors around the world, providing open source software to create modern smart grid technology that will make the distribution of power much more efficient. I already mentioned the hardware area of projects like RISC-V, but we're also working in areas in other parts of the semiconductor sector, open power, the CHIPS Alliance, and more. And in standards, our Alliance for Open Media, Open Chain, Chaos Project, SPDX platform are all internationally recognized standards. You know, our organization works tirelessly to facilitate the co-development of open hardware, open standards, open data, and open source. But a lot of people ask me, just what does the Linux Foundation do specifically to facilitate that collective innovation? And the answer is this. We host up to 29,000 meetings every single year. We work with hundreds of thousands of technical contributors across all of our projects. We set up CD, version control systems, mailing lists, communication vehicles, decision-making structures, ways to manage intellectual property, enforce trademarks, and much, much more. These are thousands of repositories with millions of lines of code added each week, millions of builds monitored every single day, hundreds of thousands of logged issues that we chase down, millions of email and chat messages about how to make decisions about this modern technology, and the facilitation of tens of thousands of contribution agreements that enable people to use the software created at the Linux Foundation with confidence that the intellectual property is well managed. In order to facilitate this type of collective innovation, one of the things that we've needed to do is build specific tools that allow us to scale. Previously, we would have to work with dozens and dozens of different technologies, build systems, communication vehicles, package management tools, version control systems, uh, event systems, virtual meeting platforms, and much, much more. It would take weeks and months to provision all of this technology for a large open source project such as a Node.js, a Kubernetes, or a Linux. Today, we have a platform that automates a lot of the deployment and stand up of that uh, process. That's called, that we've called that platform LFX. What LFX does is allows our communities to stand up all of the tooling that they need to collaborate at scale. Specifically, they can use the tools that they love and choose between GitHub or GitLab or Git or any version control system and get up and running quickly. In addition, we're able to take data from the various systems that our development communities work on and provide them with insightful analytics that will help them improve their communities. 
For example, we can show the distribution of different participants, who's doing the majority of the work, who's an up and coming developer. Maybe there's a, a metric that we can show that allows you to track the mean time to first pull request for a net new contributor and much, much more. By working to accelerate the uh, ability for folks to collaborate quickly, providing actionable insights to our communities to help them improve, we're able to create some of the most reliable and trustworthy open source projects in the world. In addition, the Linux Foundation is expanding into original research that will help us understand how the open source community collaborates and ways that we can help them improve. You know, whether it's uh, a survey to open source maintainers, asking them how they could use help to avoid maintainer burnout, to get better resources, to provide secure software, uh, and just in general be helpful. We're working on original research and polling millions of developers to help us better understand how to accelerate the great open source movement that we're all a part of. In addition, we're looking at specific areas where open source can be helpful in incredibly important issues like climate change, or maybe some just fun issues like the entertainment industry. Our organization continues to accelerate in 2022. This year, we've added 155 new high impact projects. These are projects that are used as critical infrastructure in various vertical industries that are, in some cases, mission critical technology. This year, we've passed over 2.4 million trainees. Our organization is home to a training group that provides free and low cost training to these millions of developers all over the world. Our events team has convened over 90,000 attendees with over 3,000 speakers from 15,000 organizations getting together and communicating about how we can all make open source better. And finally, we're adding a new member every single day, responding to the incredible demand for the kind of collaboration services that our organization provides both industry and the community of open source maintainers that are so important to this movement. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about one important issue that's facing the open source community, and that's the idea of trust. Open source is fundamentally built on this concept of trust, that the source code that is being co-developed comes from reliable sources, is proven technology that someone can use to create something that they will use as an important product or service, or in some cases, as a life critical, mission critical application. And it's that trust that's so important to preserve as we go into the future. One of the headwinds that we faced in terms of preserving this trust is the great increase in software security attacks that have been happening in the last few years. Software supply chain attacks have increased dramatically, whether it's repo hijacking of an NPM package, whether it's inserting malware into an open source project, or whether it's accidental vulnerabilities that are discovered like such as the log4j uh, vulnerability. All of this adds up to a a uh, point where we need to really be introspective about how we can improve our collective trust. And at the Linux Foundation, we're doing just that. Before we talk about trust, I think it's really important to understand how code flows from a developer to a user. Code starts with the most important people in the open source ecosystem, and these are the developers, and even more importantly, the maintainers who uh, create the source code that we all collectively depend upon. In many cases, those developers and maintainers may be working on those open source projects as part of their job, or in many cases, they're doing it as something that they enjoy as either a hobby or they're working as a volunteer. What ends up happening is that some of these volunteers or people who are doing it as maybe a smaller part of their day job 
end up becoming incredible accidental heroes. As their technology becomes more and more popular, the demands to keep that software maintained in a robust way uh, become extremely burdensome. And it's important for us to all recognize that and understand that that's just the start of how software flows throughout the supply chain. That code then is packaged up and distributed via uh, package management tools. They're come, they come together in a build system that pulls dependency from those package managers and eventually flows to those consumers. At each point in that flow of code, there are weak points that we should look at to shore up in order to increase the collective trust of the open source ecosystem. The Linux Foundation has been working through our Open Source Security Foundation, a coalition of major technology organizations and community developers, to go look at these specific points and provide solutions to increase our collective security. A few examples of that work include uh, efforts to provide free training to open source developers on secure coding practices, to have scorecards to understand what the security profile of critical open source projects are. We have tools that allow for cryptographic signing of open source packages through build services. Just this week, NPM announced that they'll be using the Linux Foundation's Open Source Security Foundation SIGSTORE project to provide cryptographic package signing for NPM packages. We have ways to provide secure scanning of open source or security scanning for open source projects at no cost. Our Alpha Omega project is auditing critical open source projects through third party audit vendors and much, much more. All of this activity has been done collectively in conjunction with both industry and government to shore up this collective trust. We're just getting started on this. And if you want to participate, you can go to the Open Source Security Foundation's website to join and to participate. You know, if we can address this trust issue, I think that we can build an even more trustworthy form of software that we have ever seen in the world today. You know, in proprietary software, there are lots of best practices around producing secure code but you wouldn't be able to transparently examine whether or not those things are working until it's too late and there's been a vulnerability. In the case of open source code, there's wide transparency, but as I just went through, a collective need for improvement in the security practices from one project to another. If we can do those things, open source combined with the state of the art development practices that we're advocating for, can produce an even better open source movement and more adoption of the kind of collective innovation that brings the technology that all of us depend on every day. I want to thank you all for listening today. And again, I wish I could see you all in person, and I hope to be able to travel to your part of the world soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim, for the update and for sharing all of the exciting things that are happening at the LF and in open source in general. Next, it is my pleasure to welcome Mike Swift, CEO and co-founder of Major League Hacking. Swift's expertise lies in software engineering and in building and scaling diverse and inclusive developer communities. He's on a mission to empower the next generation of technologists, and that's what he's gonna discuss with us today. Please welcome Swift to the stage. Hey, Open Source Summit Latin America, and thank you for coming out to my talk today. Even more than two years into the pandemic, we're all still navigating uncharted waters right now. COVID has thrown the future of education and work into flux. It exacerbated and accelerated a global skill shortage that's been brewing for more than a decade. And on top of that, the technical infrastructure that every company in the world depends on is starting to crumble under its own weight. If we want to reverse these trends, we need to rethink everything we thought we knew about how to train the next generation of technologists and great open source citizens. I'm here today to give you a small preview of that future. For those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Swift, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Major League Hacking. I was an aspiring lawyer who turned software engineer after I attended my first hackathon. 
Since that day, more than a decade ago, I've been doing everything I can to empower our next generation of technologists, helping them to learn the skills and build the network that they need to go and launch their careers. The day after I got home from my first hackathon, I immediately changed my major to computer science. As an outsider, that seemed like the obvious pathway into software engineering. But what I quickly realized was that the things you learn in a computer science class are not actually the things that you need to be employable in tech. There are a lot of the theory, a lot of things that would be really valuable once I already had a job, but I wasn't really learning how to solve problems with code, which is what employers actually care about. That was a skill that I was luckily learning at hackathons every weekend outside of class instead. And it ends up, I wasn't the only person who felt that way either. In fact, 88% of aspiring technologists today say that they just aren't learning the skills that they need to get started in their careers in a classroom. Meanwhile, on the employer side, 90% of hiring managers say that it's difficult to find and hire tech talent with the skills that they need to solve the problems they have today. And those numbers are pre-COVID too. Things have only gotten exponentially worse since then. This disparity is what we call the tech skills gap. And it's the number one threat to business success on every executive's mind today. At the beginning of 2020, there were nearly 1 million unfilled jobs in tech just in the US. Think about what it's like globally. Access to talent has been consistently rated as a greater threat than access to capital for most startups. Between the great resignation, the accelerated digital transformation, eroded faith in our education system, COVID has started to squeeze the job market hard from all sides. Helping to close the tech skills gap is one of the reasons that I founded Major League Hacking, also known as MLH. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, MLH is a mission-driven B Corp that's helping our next generation of technologists actually gain the skills they need to be employable. We do it by creating hands-on experiential learning opportunities where developers can gain practical experience with the actual tools that they'll use in their career and demonstrate that they can solve problems to potential employers. Things like hackathons, meetups, conferences, fellowship programs, anywhere an aspiring technologist can get their hands dirty with code. We're there supporting them in that journey. And last year, we helped more than one third of all computer science graduates in the United States get their start. They're all members of the MLH community. And over the last nine years, that community has grown to include more than half a million members from around the world. They came from more than 90 countries and thousands of universities, boot camps, and all kinds of backgrounds. It's the largest community of early career technologists in the world. And it's also among the most diverse. While gender is just one metric, more than 47% of our community identified as non-male last year. Compare that to the average 18% non-male in a computer science classroom in the US. Fun fact, many of our alumni probably already actually work at your companies. Just pull your engineering team when you get back. That's because we partner with the world's leading technology companies to help them build strong, diverse tech talent pipelines. We work together to identify the hard and soft skills that they need and create training pathways for our community to empower them to learn and actually apply those skills. Along the way, we collect thousands of data points that our customers can use for everything like identifying macro trends, all the way down to making great individual hires. Between our community and our customers, there's another trend that we've been seeing that imperatively requires attention of everyone at this conference. That trend is the looming open source infrastructure crisis. The demand for high quality open source software is rapidly outpacing our ability to supply it sustainably. Many of the open source technologies that we rely on are at risk of going unmaintained or being abandoned entirely. Uh, with more than 90% of software depending on open source, this is a threat that's actually existential. Using GitHub's public data sets, we can visualize this trend by looking at, at a, the growth of new unresolved issues created year over year. While it shouldn't be a surprise that the number of open issues is up exponentially in recent years, the alarming statistic is the number of unresolved issues is also growing by nearly 40% year over year. We've created a backlog of more than 19 million unresolved issues already. And that's just public repositories, not all the private code bases you depend on every day. This is creating a perpetual backlog that's literally drowning maintainers and causing them to burn out. In fact, according to a recent maintainer survey, three in five maintainers have either quit or seriously considered quitting maintaining a project. It's due to feeling overwhelmed and underappreciated. As we all know, open source is often a labor of love for maintainers. 
And that can be true even when you are working on open source for your employer. It's thankless work and it's piling up faster than anyone can manage. And it's not like maintainers aren't asking for help either. In fact, 80% of them listed finding and recruiting new contributors and 90% of them listed that improving the experience of new contributors as one of their three top priorities they need help with. In order to get out from under the backlog and alleviate some of the burden maintainers' shoulders, we need more hands on deck. And maintainers aren't the only ones who are worried about the lack of new open source citizens either. In fact, 92% of employers say that finding talent with open source skills is difficult. Meanwhile, more than half of businesses say that they're hoping for increased hiring these critical, hard to find skills next year. Given that tech unemployment is so low, our only hope at addressing this gap is our future tech talent pipeline. And it's not like new developers don't believe in open source. You know, when we poll our community at Major League Hacking, 93% of our community members say that they believe open source will be important to the future of their career. So where the heck are all these new open source citizens? Well, it ends up that more than half of all the new developers coming online want to contribute to open source, but they haven't been able to yet. That's a massive opportunity cost for maintainers and the businesses that depend on their software. It gets even more frustrating though. When we dig in and ask them, why haven't you contributed? What's holding you back? It's something that's entirely addressable. For 33% of them, it's about just not knowing where to start. The number of repositories, issues, and other insider process can feel overwhelming for a beginner. Another 31% say it's about a lack of confidence in their skills. But again, there's such a wide range of issues that inevitably there's something for every skill level out there. So to recap where we are, the demand for qualified tech talent is dramatically outpacing supply. Our open source infrastructure is starting to crumble under its own weight and our classrooms aren't teaching practical skills that you need to be able to contribute open source or hit the ground running in a job. All this adds up to an existential crisis for tech that we all need to deal with. So what can we do about it? Well, a few summers ago at the beginning of the pandemic, MOH saw an opportunity and teamed up with some of our partners to launch a new program specifically designed to close this gap. Meet the MOH Fellowship. We match developers from our community with real world open source projects from partners like GitHub, Meta, Amazon, and so many more. Over the course of 12 weeks, they collaborate with other aspiring software engineers from all around the world on these projects. Um, they have access to an amazing group of technical mentors, participate in events like hackathons and a speaker series, and they navigate a fully integrated skill-based curriculum throughout their journey. At the end of all of it, they walk away with an amazing portfolio piece for their resume, a real world open source contribution, and a pathway to employment at a company that's actually using that software in production. From our partner's perspective, this program is a dream come true. They're investing both in the technology and the talent pipeline that their business depends on. And it's not a drain on internal resources for teams that are already stretched thin or maintainers that just have so much work. MLH takes care of everything. We do sourcing, screening, matching, management, mentorship, and finally evaluating of fellows. Your team can focus on building relationships, making real progress on your roadmap, and finding the right future talent to support your goals. And the results have been pretty incredible so far. Since we started this program, about 30,000 applicants have come in every single year, and it's growing too. And this isn't just somebody filling out their email address. This is closer to a university admissions process with each application taking around 45 minutes to complete between essays, code samples, and matching qualifications. We're able to use the data insights from our massive global developer community to identify early talent that's right on the cusp of, of being ready to contribute open source, but just needs a little help getting over the edge. And I'm proud to say that so far we've enrolled and graduated more than 800 fellows from around the world. They range from current university students to boot camp grads, career changers, to even existing engineers who are just looking for a chance to come back and level up a bit. They learn software engineering best practices, navigating our curriculum, attending daily stand-ups, participating in show and tells and retrospectives, and ultimately contributing to their project. With more than 70% of fellows coming from an underrepresented background in tech, it's also among the most diverse talent pipelines out there. And to be clear, these fellows aren't just working on tutorial projects either. 
They're making contributions to real major open source projects like React, Jest, Homebrew, Flask, and so many more. Collectively, fellows submitted more than 1,300 pull requests upstream. And with an 80 to 90% merge rate, they're meaningfully helping to push these projects forward for all of us. But don't just take my word for it. Let's hear it from some of the people in this program that it's impacted. The MLH Fellowship exists to help the next generation of software engineers start their careers. They'll work on a variety of projects which give them the ability and confidence to go and land a job. It's been three months. I didn't even realize how fast it passed. The Fellowship is basically a bunch of people that are super into uh, tech and super into building cool stuff and learning, most of all. And uh, everybody in the program showed that we all went from open source consumers to open source contributors. But what I took away from the program was so much more than just how to contribute. What I took away was this amazing sense of community. I'm coming out of the fellowship, the Explorer Fellowship, with three amazing open source projects that can be real products in the real world today. For while this fellowship I only last three months, I know its impact will last a lifetime. MLH gives me this sense of, um, of um, one big family which is, it's really a reason to smile every day, right? I have to say, it was the most incredible experience. And the MLH Fellowship gave me the, the opportunity that I don't think I would have otherwise. I actually do feel more like a software developer today than I felt before. Because it has given me this motivation and a huge portfolio that I can now present in front of potential employers. Clearly fellows love this program, but are we actually helping graduates get started in their careers too? Well, the answer is a resounding yes, and I'd love to share a recent story about how we helped one of our graduates find his way and land his dream job. Meet Christos. Christos discovered coding during his first year of university after registering for some computer science classes. Unfortunately, he found the classes boring because they were very basic, theory heavy, and lacked any practical application. It got so bad that Christos was even considering changing his major. Around the end of his second year though, he decided to start researching web and desktop development. Up to this point in his coding journey, Christos had only ever really built terminal-based applications for class. Being able to create things that real users could engage with ignited a new passion within him. He saw a pathway for his code to help others and was constantly on the lookout for opportunities to use his newly found tech skills to solve his friends' problems. Eventually, the time came for Christos to start looking for jobs in software engineering. And that's when he encountered tech's Catch-22. In order to get a job in tech, employers wanted to see experience on his resume. But in order to get experience on his resume, he needed to have a job in tech. Christos needed somebody who was going to take a chance on him and give him the opportunity to build that initial experience. That's when he discovered MLH and the MLH Fellowship. After researching MLH in depth and hearing all of the positive feedback from past fellows, Christos applied for the MLH Fellowship, and to his surprise, he was accepted. He got matched to the Apache Ozone Project, which was being sponsored by G Research, a fintech company interested in hiring hackers. Christos had never contributed to a major open source project before, but thanks to the MLH Fellowship's supporting resources, he made multiple contributions that all got merged in. These contributions made an amazing addition to his resume and led directly to G Research, offering him a full-time job as a software developer. Today, Christos is still contributing to Apache Ozone, and he's looking for opportunities to inspire even more hackers to follow in his footsteps too. And fellows like Christos weren't the only ones with positive things to say either. Here's a quote from one of the core maintainers of Palettes, which includes tools like Flask, Click, and Jinja, if you're familiar. That millions of Python developers depend on these projects. Having MLH Fellows actively enabled him and his team to be more productive and to make an impact on their roadmap. In addition to making maintainers' lives better, this program has made employers feel more engaged and uh, helping with both hiring and open source. Here's a quote from one of our mentors from a recent program we ran with Meta or Facebook. From her perspective, participating in a program like this is an ideal onboarding experience. And frankly, I share her sentiment too. The opportunity to learn skills and tools that I'd need to hit the ground running in my first job would have been a dream come true. 
And being able to contribute to open source and collaborate with some of my future peers would have been icing on the cake. Looking at the results, it's clear that we're onto something big here. We've been able to build an extremely diverse talent pipeline that's trained in open source and software engineering best practices with a proven track record of writing production quality code and the confidence and network to support them. Meanwhile, our customers have been able to demonstrate clear, meaningful ROI across engineering, HR, OSPO, and DevRel. They made real progress on their roadmaps, strengthened their most critical technical infrastructure, built meaningful relationships with future talent, and improved the happiness and satisfaction of their existing employees and maintainers. Plus, this whole thing is faster, more cost-effective, and produces better results than a traditional internship program. So what's not to love? But let's take a few steps back now and ask ourselves, what can we learn from all this? What can you start implementing tomorrow when you head back to work? Well, I've got three big takeaways for you. And coincidentally, they're all bits of advice that I've been giving to DevRel and OSPO programs for more than a decade now. I think there's a lot that everyone can learn from our community and vice versa. The first takeaway is that the traditional silos between teams no longer work in the post-COVID world. Rapid digitalization has dramatically in increased the interconnectivity between individuals, teams, and even organizations. You need to, to form cross-functional coalitions that align around each team's core metrics. While our partners with the fellowship always had a champion from engineering, OSPO, DevRel, or HR, the most successful customers have brought in counterparts from other teams to provide additional budget, projects, and resources. These Internal partnerships are stickier, more visible, and ultimately produce better results for everyone. The second takeaway is that programs like this need to demonstrate ROI from day zero. As everyone who works in, you know, in DevRel or in an OSPO knows, there's a massive misunderstanding about what our teams do and why they're actually important. That results in budget cuts that you know, end up with program or staff reductions, uh, constantly shifting metrics, and frankly, demoralization and burnout. The ability to create and demonstrate clear, measurable ROI from the very beginning that ties into business metrics like talent or our engineer roadmap aligns with the success of the overall business. Consolidating these business metrics into digestible content that you can easily share internally on a regular basis ensures that the traction is always top of mind for our executive sponsors and colleagues. Finally, my last takeaway is that you need to be thinking long-term. The existential problems we face in business or society, frankly, are rarely resolved by short-term solutions. We need to make investments that will pay off in three, five, 10 years from now. Remember, tech unemployment is so low. Fighting over existing talent is zero sum, and we will eventually drive up the cost to the point of being unsustainable. Similarly, investing in programs that drive up new contributors without teaching them the best practices or showing them how to become contributors in the long term, they'll just add a mountain of work to maintainers to deal with even more so than what they already have. The same way that startups look for compounding growth, we need to be designing programs that have potential for exponential increases in ROI and scale for the open source community. So there you have it. Focus on building cross-functional coalitions that align around each team's core metrics Find ways to demonstrate clear, measurable ROI from day zero and tell that story regularly. And think long-term when designing programs, looking for exponential increases in ROI and scale down the road. Of course, MLH and I would love to advise, support, and partner with you on any of these initiatives. You can learn more about MLH and the MLH Fellowship in particular on our website at fellowship.mlh.io slash partners. We're running three batches of this program per year and now is a perfect time to start thinking about your 2023 strategy. Additionally, if you're struggling for any, with any of the challenges I talked about today, I'd love to speak with you individually. Please feel free to reach out and message me on the app uh, to, make, to connect or drop me an email using my contact info at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to, to uh, uh, also connect with me on social. Once again, I'm Swift from Major League Hacking. Uh, thanks everybody, happy hacking, and enjoy the rest of Open Source Summit Latin America. Thank you so much, Swift. It's so interesting to hear what you're doing to innovate the next generation. Now, I would like to introduce Elder Moraes from Red Hat,
who will join Jackson Philho of Microsoft to discuss key aspects of the combination of two major technology fronts for software systems, open source and the cloud. Please help me welcome Jackson and Elder. Hello there, everyone. Uh, my name is Jackson Filho. I'm a developer product marketing manager for Microsoft Azure uh, in the Latin America team. Um, and I'm here today to talk about the combination of cloud technologies and open source. That's a, a super interesting theme. We love talking about it. And um, I have here today with me my friend Elder. Um, he's a long time developer relations professional. He has been talking about technologies to this beautiful audience for so long. Um, Elde, I'm super happy to have you here. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation topic today with this amazing audience. Um, so the thing is, we know that the combination of cloud technologies uh, with open source really does enable software teams to innovate faster and more collaboratively, ultimately. I, I, I love the collaboration aspect of open source and definitely more securely, and especially on Azure, may I say. Um, so what are your thoughts on the potential of this uh, cloud plus, plus open source combination? Sure. And, and by the way, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity and thank for the audience for being with us here today. Uh, I would highlight three aspects. First one, it's uh, the, the part of security, because when we rely on open source projects, especially the, the biggest one uh, related to security, we can improve this uh, on our platforms, on our systems, on everything that we, we are building for our businesses we can uh, gain a lot of proactive uh, stuff on the, the security part. The second one I would say about automation, especially when we th think about containers that really changed the way that we build and distribute applications on the industry. And when we combine containers with Kubernetes, for example, two of the great uh, open source examples on, on the industry, we can have uh, scalability, we can have availability, we can uh, automation, have automation as well. And the third part is the databases. We, uh, we more and more are adding databases to the cloud uh, context, and we can combine both uh, traditional database, relational database, and no relation and, and the, uh, big data database, for example, and we can leverage uh, all the solutions that we are building. So all of them uh, in the open source and cloud world. Awesome. That, that, that is awesome. And I would love to hear your perspective on the optimization of open source investments on, on the cloud. Can you, can you talk a bit about it? Sure. Well, uh, maybe one of the biggest uh, open source projects that we have uh, for since, since forever is the Linux. And when we have the Linux experience on our workloads, we can have uh, all the security that we got from Linux. We can have all the growing, uh, growing platform that we have with Linux on the cloud. And so we can have containers, we can have data, we can have managed service, uh, software as a service, we can have all the solutions that we are building uh, based on Linux. So these aspects for me will bring a lot of uh, identity uh, management, security, hybrid capabilities. So all that we got from uh, Linux, that's a great open source uh, example. Yeah, for sure. And and guys, uh, everyone, I, I just uh, would like to thank Elder so much for his participation today. Uh, make sure you follow him on social networks, especially uh, Twitter. Uh, you will find his Twitter Twitter uh, handle here. Um, Elder, thank you so much. I'm no stranger to this audience. You have been working around with us uh, for so long and for sure for many um for many years ahead, we will be uh, discussing technologies and, and, and talking to this audience. So thank you very much for your participation. Great, my friend. Thank you and see you. Bye bye. Bye. Now I would like to welcome my friend Giovanni Bassi. He is a Microsoft MVP and he has been really working with us for, for many years now, uh, talking about developer and software developer technology for, for so long. and. Uh, 
we really like his perspective on open source technologies, right? So that is why uh, we invited him. He accepted the challenge to be here with us today. And uh, Basi, uh, same as we talked to Elder, um, this combination of cloud technologies with open source, we really believe it's a powerful combination. And uh, we believe it really enables uh, these software development teams to innovate much faster and more collaboratively. So I would love to hear your opinions on that, your thoughts on that. Hi, Jackson. Th thanks for having me. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, uh, I, I love Linux. I have been working with Linux for years, so it's it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, so um, open source will actually improve everything, right? So and, and Linux with that. So uh, it will uh, when you when you talk about uh, open source and cloud, it, yes, it will uh, also help us uh, in in the cloud space. Uh, open source can help you uh, enhance collaboration and. Uh, attract the best talent. People actually want to work uh, with open source tools, and this will uh, uh, open source will also help you uh, improve uh, the teamwork. People will actually be able to collaborate better, uh, and this will also uh, mean uh, moving your uh, your applications to the cloud because open source tools are are, are available for everyone, um, and your it's actually better to uh, easier to run your app anywhere. You can uh, develop your apps, uh, your apps locally. Uh, you can move them to the cloud, to the edge. We just mentioned containers. Containers are everywhere now, and it's all based on open source technology. And the cloud is is making it uh, even better. And uh, the velocity of your teams is also going to improve because the tools are already available. So your teams are going to be more empowered. Thank, thank you, Basi. And, and, and may, may I ask you another question? Um, I, I know that you're a big fan of code automation, right? Having better productivity with your teams. So we understand that open source technologies combined to the cloud. And as we like to say, this code to cloud journey, uh, that's a beautiful combination, right? So I would love to hear your thoughts on code automation, perhaps uh, GitHub combined with Azure. So uh, I, I would love to hear from you. Yeah, uh, I, GitHub was the great uh, uh, popularizer, I, th I see, of uh, open source, at least for me, uh, when like 10 or 15 years ago, it actually uh, brought open source to everyone, right? And today, uh, what uh, GitHub is doing with GitHub Actions and other tools is actually make it much, much, much faster to get your code uh, to whatever, where, wherever you need to run it, as we just said before, right? So uh, cloud is also an, a, 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 a good option. So you, you, if you uh, want to get your code to Azure, for example, it's really easy to just uh, create a GitHub Action and, and deliver it. Uh, to deliver it there. So uh, this helps you, you break the silos in your company. I'm a great uh, advocate for uh, developer teams, which includes uh, operations people and work the real DevOps, right? When people we actually work together. And uh, this is a division I have for uh, uh, our future. So where the infrastructure people, the developer people, they are all working together on the same teams. Um, and this is uh, also going to help us bring open source to the enterprise because, as I said before, these are free tools. These are tools that we can we can try that even other people and other companies have have tried. And there are uh, there there are templates available for us for us to use and, and bring them to the cloud. Um, and also another really interesting thing is uh, uh, if you if you are not able to uh, open your your own code, you could. Uh, foster an inner source mentality in your company where your your app is not open source, but it's open in, in, inside your company, right? So uh, you can use all the open source experience and uh, combine with the open source tools to actually uh, make your, 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 your inside your your tools available to all your companies to uh, everyone to develop them together and for example github will help you with the issues all the all the all the open source workflow you already know you can use on your own tools and this will actually make better apps right and all the and all the flexibility the security the compliance it's all there it's actually all the same tools right so it's really easy to go from a, a closed team 
to a, a, an inner source project, right? So this is all due to uh, what uh, open source and Linux brought us in, in, from, from the last decades, right? Yeah, no, for sure. Big fan of inner source. Love that you brought this team up to the table. Um, and everyone, thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Giovanni, for, for uh, your participation here. As you know, I'm a big fan and uh, we, we will definitely continue to, to discuss this theme with the audience for, for uh, many years ahead. <laughs> and um, uh, everyone, we as Microsoft, we, we, we really want to continue this conversation with you. That's, we, that's why we will leave a link here, just so you can uh, click and uh, we will be able to continue this conversation. Um, Basti also has, Giovanni here also has a Twitter handle that I follow all the time with lots of great informationology and some of his uh, opinions of his own that I, that I really cherish. So everyone, I would love to um, say thank you. Thank you, uh, Open Source Summit team. Thank you, Linux Foundation, for the opportunity to talk about this subject um, with you. And uh, I'm Jackson. Uh, thank you very much and see you next time. See you. Thanks so much, everyone. That was great. Now, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Gabrielle Colombro. As founder and executive director of the FinTech Open Source Foundation, Gab has led the creation of an open source community in one of the most conservative industries in the world. Today, he'll provide an overview of the exciting developments and opportunities for open source collaboration in the industry, and he'll also tell us where all the secrets are kept. Please welcome Gab Colombro. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, share with you uh, some updates from the uh, financial services world. Um, I'm going to try to do this presentation in Spanish. It's a little rusty. Uh, and I want to apologize already to the uh, Portuguese speakers in South America. I, I want to follow Portuguese, uh, uh, so I'm going to start uh, and uh, let's see uh, uh, if we can make a, an interesting presentation today. Uh, hola, buenos días a todos. Uh, vamos a hablar hoy de, de algo que solo hace uno, unos años um, uh, parecía imposible. Uh, uh, la, el crecimiento del movimiento de open source en la industria financiera. Yo soy Gabriel Columbro, el ex director ejecutivo de Finos, la FinTech Open Source Foundation. Um, como puede escuchar por mi acento, soy italiano, pero uh, vivo en California. Y hoy vamos a hablar de nuestras experiencias con el crecimiento del open source en una industria muy conservativa y muy regulada como uh, los servicios financieros. Uh, ante todo, una pequeña introducción de Finos. Uh, Cualquier vez que presento esta transparencia, soy muy orgulloso de eh, eh, notar cómo hay ahora casi 60 miembros en Finos, um, que son uh, empresas financieras, que son asset managers, uh, que pueden ser uh, uh, empresas de tecnología, tanto como open source, como de cloud, como de fintech. Um, y muy recientemente tenemos también consorcios de, de la industria de, um, que trabajan en estándares, que trabajan en, en policy y que miran a open source como una manera de acelerar uh, su proceso en open source. Uh, pero la verdad es que no, nosotros no estamos medidos por uh, miembros, estamos medidos por los proyectos que entregan valor a, a la industria. Y estoy muy orgulloso uh, de deciros que tenemos casi 50 proyectos entre uh, estándares abiertos, entre proyectos de código abierto y uh, um, special interest groups. Bueno, um, si hay tres cosas de que vamos a hablar hoy, uh, vamos a empezar a hablar de cómo FinTech uh, um, está viviendo una nueva generación uh, a través de open source. Uh, Vamos a hablar un poco de lo bueno, lo malo y lo feo de, de lo que está pasando eh, en Open Source and Financial Services, entonces un estado de la unión. Y, y luego vamos a hablar cómo vamos a, 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 a seguir uh, creciendo esta comunidad y cómo puedes involucrarte si estás uh, uh, interesado. 
Uh, lo primero que quiero compartir es que si, como decíamos, uh, si, si vas hace 10 años, si miras hace 10 años, uh, la percepción de open source en la industria financiera siempre ha sido muy, muy cerrada. O sea que había títulos como estos, Why Wall Street, uh, uh, ¿Por qué Wall Street odia a open source? Uh, mira que estamos hablando solo de hace 10 años, no de 15, 20 o 30 años. Entonces, es, estoy muy orgulloso de compartir con vosotros que la verdad es que la percepción, no solo la percepción de eh, colaboración en open source um, está cambiando en la industria, ha cambiado muchísimo, uh, tanto en empresas financieras como en empresas de tecnología fintech. Uh, estos son artículos que os enseño uh, de los últimos años, ¿verdad? En los últimos 12 meses hemos, hemos visto una aceleración uh, también a nivel de prensa, también a nivel de uh, interés de todos los constituentes de la industria uh, en no solo consumir open source, sino contribuir en open source. Uh, también venture capitalists como uh, Andrés Norvitz, uh, esta presentación es de hace un año y habla de cómo open source va a ser el motor uh, uh, para una nueva generación de, de tecnología financiera. Um, y la verdad es que lo que uh, uh, proporcionan es la idea de crear primitivas open source uh, que pueden uh, ser utilizadas tan por fintech como por bancos. Y esto es muy parecido a lo que Finos, a, a, a la visión de Finos uh, de los últimos seis años. Entonces, Personalmente, fue muy feliz uh, de ver a uh, um, Andrés Norovitz, uno de los, más, de los venture capitalists más respetables, hablar de cómo también en, en las startups de fintech, open source tiene que ser un pilar importante de su estrategia. Um, como decía, eh, la verdad es que esto era el mismo mensaje, la misma visión uh, que nos hemos creado por Finos. Hace cinco años, nos empezamos en 2000, ¿verdad? Seis años, en 2016. Eh, la idea era la de crear estandarización a través de compartir trabajo en código común para tener soluciones que sean valuables para todos los constituentes de la industria, que sean empresas financieras, que sean fintech vendor, que sean uh, ven vendedores de tecnología, big tech, uh, que sean asset managers y reguladores. Uh, creemos que hay un ventaja, una ventaja uh, que open source uh, uh, te permita de uh, 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 contribuir y entonces conducir tu estrategia, um, pero haciendo el bien de la industria. Uh, y esto es la verdad es la, la proporción, la proposición de una fundación vertical como Finos. Uh, Fíjate, fíjate, fíjate que tenemos también una conferencia que está dedicada uh, por open source en servicios financieros, eh, el Open Source in Finance Forum. Entonces, si alguno de vosotros uh, va a estar en Nueva York uh, en diciembre, uh, me gustaría muchísimo uh, tener la representación de América Latina en esta comunidad que es global. Uh, bueno. Vamos a mirar un poco más uh, uh, en profundidad uh, qué está pasando en open source en servicios financieros. Um, empezamos con lo bueno. Yo soy un optimista. Um, si, no has, si no conoces el uh, State of Open Source in Financial Services uh, 2021, Finos el año pasado um, en colaboración con Linux Foundation Research, uh, um, condució una búsqueda uh, muy amplia y muy profunda uh, del estado de open source en servicios financieros. Y lo primero uh, resultado ha sido muy positivo. Uh, diferentemente de hace 10 años, uh, la industria entiende muy bien cuál, son, uh, cuál es el valor, cuáles son las motivaciones uh, para que empresas financieras tengan que hacer más open source. Y esto es súper importante. También a nivel ejecutivo nos vemos uh, gente como los CTOs, como uh, Head of uh, Open Source Program Office, Head of OSPOS, uh, conducir esta, esta, uh, este viaje de estas este, esta empresas en open source. Um, 
Y están también mejorando la manera que se ponen a, a trabajar en open source. No solo um, la la, el consumir open source está permitido, sino los bancos, 72% de, lo de, de la gente que res respondió um, um, prefiere soluciones open source y va a mirar a soluciones open source antes de soluciones propietarias. Esto es muy importante si piensas que esta es una industria que uh, en, las última, uh, en los últimos años, o oh, bueno, siempre ha estado uh, una industria muy conservativa. Y nos vemos también el, el ecosistema uh, reconocer el progreso que, que esta industria está haciendo. Uh, Goldman Sachs ha sido OSPO of the Year por el To-Do Group uh, ese año. Y ya nos vemos también a nivel de talento, uh, empresas que emplean más y más uh, uh, um, uh, recursos que vienen del mundo open source. Citi acaba de, de emplear a alguien from Red Hat. Entonces ya ves cómo tan a nivel de talento, como a nivel de proceso, como a nivel de uh, um, uh, soporte ejecutivo, uh, open source uh, está acelerando muchísimo. Um, y esto hace que los bancos puedan colaborar con... Uh, on tecno sobre tecnología en, en, de código abierto y tanto, co tanto tecnología contribuida por vendedores como nuestro uh, uh, estándar de interoperabilidad uh, uh, FDS3, uh, sino como uh, um, en código que ha estado contribuido por bancos. Uh, tenemos Perspective, que es una librería de visualización contribuida por JP Morgan, Legend, que es un, uh, una herramienta de modelación de DAO contribuida por Goldman Sachs. Uh, tenemos Morpher, uh, contribuido por Morgan Stanley, Walls, contribuido por Deutsche Bank. Entonces, no solo estos bancos están contribuyendo a proyectos de otros en, en como pequeña pull request, merge request, sino están contribuyendo nuevo proyecto al open source. Años y años de propiedad intelectual que ahora se pueden uh, utilizar de forma completamente abierta. Um, es esto que, que eh, estas son estadísticas que presenté eh, el mes pasado a nuestro Open Source Strat Strategy Forum, Open Source in Finance Forum, perdona. Y como ves, entonces no solo es la adopción de open source, estos son números muy importantes de crecimiento de, de eh, bajadas de nuestro software uh, uh, desde los repositorios centrales como Maven Central o como NPM, sino también la contribución sigue creciendo, um, no solo a nivel de número de contribuidores, nuestra contributor strength, sino el total número de contribuidores eh, en el tiempo, en la vida de Finos, sino también, como os decía, la contribución de nuevo, uh, nuevas piezas, nuevos componentes uh, en código abierto. Y, y ahora vuelvo a, a lo que decía antes, que la verdad es que todos los constituyentes se están dando cuenta que hay una ventaja en colaborar en open source. Uh, instituciones financieras mejoran su acceso al talento uh, y también reducen los costos, uh, los gastos. Uh, uh, los vendedores de fintech pueden integrar e interoperar más fácilmente con los bancos. Uh, los, los vendedores de tecnología pueden acelerar su uh, penetración del mercado financiero. Uh, el buy side, lo que tiene la pasta, <ríe> uh, tiene un interés muy importante en interoperar con uh, todas las instituciones financieras y finalmente los reguladores. Uh, no creemos que es un, una pieza muy importante uh, de, nuestro, de nuestro puzzle. Uh, uh, ¿Por qué los reguladores tienen un interés muy importante en colaborar de forma transparente, uh, de forma más eficiente con, con nuestro dinero? Uh, entonces, uh, una de las iniciativas más importantes de Finos es de trabajar con reguladores para que no solo adopten tecnología open source, sino que ponen la regla, que pongan la regla en, uh, en open source. Um, pero no solo son contribuciones en finos, sino también a, a, en upstream. Nos vemos los bancos que eh, empiezan a contribuir, a participar, uh, no solo 
a, a, a una fundación vertical enfocada en servicios financieros como Finos, sino en fundaciones más horizontales como Hyperledger, como Cloud Native Computing Foundation, como OS Climate. Uh, y creo que el ejemplo más importante es, tenemos tres miembros de Finos que ahora son miembros uh, uh, Platinum, se sientan en, en, en el Board of Directors de OpenSSF, la fundación dedicada a resolver uh, uh, el problema de seguridad en open source y de sostenibilidad en open source. Esto es muy importante porque era posible que después de log, log for shell como estoy seguro que conocen la, la vulnerabilidad que, que pasó el año pasado, um, era posible que estos bancos se retiraran de open source por el miedo. La verdad es que ya están uh, uh, um, ampliando su inversión uh, en, en entender que todo, uh, todo tiene un rol uh, uh, en la seguridad del open source. Um, última novedad, y esta es, es uh, hot of the presses, Uh, um, también los, los, um, los grupos que desarrollan estándares en, en, desde muchos años en la industria están mirando a Finos y a Open Source como una manera de uh, uh, llevar estos estándares directamente en la mano de los desarrolladores. Uh, entonces, estamos muy, muy orgullosos de anunciar que Finos va a ser a, a, la entidad que va a desarrollar eh, el, el Common Domain Model uh, para asociaciones de, de la industria como ISDA, ISLA y ICMA. Bueno, hemos hablado de lo bueno, pasamos a, a, lo, a lo malo o por lo menos a lo, a lo menos bueno. Um, claramente hay más que hacer, en, en, tanto a nivel de organización, solo 35% de los bancos tienen un OSPO, Uh, como a nivel de uh, um, leadership ejecutiva, uh, todavía hay casi la mitad de, de bancos o de respondientes que no pueden contribuir en open source, tampoco upstream. Uh, y claramente hay la, la mayoría de los respondientes que uh, no conocen uh, policies o que tampoco tienen posibilidad de contribuir. Entonces, mucho más trabajo que estamos haciendo en Finos, que el Todo Group está haciendo uh, en la Linux Foundation. Y creo que haya todavía muchísimas empresas, también en Sudamérica, uh, que no podemos ayudar a acelerar su viaje en open source. Y bueno, claro, uh, la issue de Google Docs. Um, todavía no se puede colaborar en Google Docs. Uh, entonces, eso sí, es un, poco, es un poco rollo de vez en cuando pero tenemos que estar pacientes, es que estos bancos están abriendo y estamos entendiendo que son, que tienen el deseo de abrirse si no, si no va a tardar algunos años uh, para que se pueda utilizar todo, todo lo herramienta moderno de colaboración que usamos uh, en open source. Y si no quieres ayudar a medir uh, cómo se está uh, uh, poniendo más rápido, uh, uh, si estamos acelerando con el progreso en open source, uh, nos ayuden a, a, a hacer este survey, State of Open Sourcing Financial Services 2022. Allí tienes el QR code. Uh, espero que podamos uh, tener un sample muy grande, uh, así que podemos comparar el crecimiento de, de este ecosistema. Um, otro que no es tan bueno es la, la uh, involucración de uh, fintechs. Uh, aparte de algunos ejemplos, todavía no veo uh, el mismo utilizo del modelo de, de open core, de, de comercialización de open source, que es muy común aquí donde vivo yo en California, uh, como poner un proyecto de proyecto open source a producto open source a profito uh, y claramente utilizar parte de esto para contribuir al proyecto open source. Entonces, uh, tener este, este bu bucle que, continua, que sigue uh, funcionando. Um, bueno, hablamos un poco de lo más feo aquí. Uh, todavía esa es una industria que está muy fragmentada y que tiene muchísimo vendor locking. Uh, no solo lo que estás acostumbrado a nivel de, claramente, eh, aplicación de, de usuario, sino los formados de los datos muchas veces son locking. Uh, las regulaciones, las regulamentaciones crean lock-in. Entonces, es una industria que todavía es muy, muy dominada por vendedores 
y vendedores que muchas veces hacen vendor blocking. Uh, y esto es algo que, que es muy común en, en industria que está, está menos madura en open source. Um, hay un montón de, se habla muchísimo de open banking. Yo soy un gran supporter de open banking uh, a, a nivel de abrir uh, uh, las informaciones que no son las nuestras, <ríe> que se pueden intercambiar de, formado, uh, 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 de forma muy simple uh, uh, en, el, en el mundo financiero. Pero hay muchísimas empresas todavía que veo que usan la noción de Open Banking o de Open Finance uh, solo porque es cool, um, solo como a nivel de marketing. Entonces, siempre miren si verdaderamente, si alguien dice que es Open Source, tiene que tener uh, código abierto o estándares uh, en una licencia que es aprobada por OSI, Open Source Initiative. Y el riesgo con toda esta fragmentación es que se vaya de, de, un, uh, de una mes centralizada, como la de Silos, a una mes completamente descentralizada, uh, en lo que hay que hacer conexiones punto a punto, que no hay estándares. Entonces, me gusta muchísimo ese movimiento de la fintech, pero no pensamos que open source puede ayudar a coordinar y a consolidar este ecosistema. Entonces, uh, ¿dónde vamos de aquí? Um, nuestra idea, afinos, uh, es en tres puntos. Ante todo, como hemos hablado, queremos mejorar y involucrar más el mundo fintech. Es un mundo muy innovativo, es un mundo de desarrolladores y de founders uh, que son más nativos de tecnología. Entonces, esto sería súper importante no solo para acelerar nuestra comunidad y crear puentes entre el mundo de fintech y FinServe, uh, sino también sería súper importante, no pensamos a nivel comercial, para las fintechs que pueden ganar de este ecosistema. Um, segundo, invitar, esta es una comunidad global, el sistema financiero es global uh, naturalmente, entonces no tiene sentido resolver problemas con open source solo a nivel re regional. Y esto creo que sea súper importante para Latinoamérica. Uh, tenemos un par de miembros en Latinoamérica, pero nos gustaría mucho más entender cuáles son los problemas regionales de Latinoamérica y a nivel de integración con el sistema financiero global. Y la manera para llegar a esto, no pensamos que es uh, la consolidación que se puede haber uh, con open source. Tenemos una comunidad que está lista, que está uh, 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 llena de contribuidores, de gente muy inteligente de estos bancos, que se ha, aprendió a colaborar en el abierto, en transparencia, uh, que es algo, verdad, que hace 10 años no podíamos pensarlo. Uh, queremos crear una digital commons uh, de financial services y luego que de forma competitiva, abierta, uh, la, los componentes open source y los estándares mejores van a ganar y van a volverse los de facto estándares para toda la industria a nivel global. Um, voy a acelerar porque estoy un poco retrasado, uh, pero la verdad es que una manera muy simple de entender lo que estamos intentando hacer en Finos es de volver la The, the amazing uh, uh, cantidad de, de, de librería y componentes de finanza que existen ya en GitHub en un um, sistema, o sea, que uh, uh, paso a paso eso va a reemplazar un sistema que está muy cerrado uh, y muy uh, a forma de silo uh, de esta empresa financiera. Y podemos claramente utilizar tu ayuda para esto. La verdad es que pensamos que Finos puede ayudaros uh, a crecer tu proyecto y el impacto de tu proyecto a nivel global, también con la ayuda de la Linux Foundation, nuestra uh, entidad madre. Entonces, uh, así que vamos a cerrar. Pensamos que tenemos, que tú vas a tener ventajas, tanto si eres un, un fundador o un chief information officer, uh, a participar en la comunidad open source en servicios financieros, uh, tanto a nivel de uh, disruption, como a nivel de uh, eficiencia, como a nivel de poder uh, uh, responder al, al requisito regulatorio um, 
uh, con tecnología que ya existe, que los bancos están contribuyendo. Y si eres un desarrollador, uh, bueno, bueno, la verdad es que tienes posibilidad de colaborar con algunos de los desarrolladores más listos en el mundo. En el servicio financiero hay gente súper inteligente. Uh, pero también uh, 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 mejorar tu carrera. Esa es una industria que es muy rica <ríe> y verdad que eh, es muy, estamos al principio de nuestra comunidad. Entonces, uh, te, creo que contribuir y volverte en un líder de nuestra comunidad uh, seguramente va a ser uh, uh, positivo para tu carrera. Entonces, uh, uh, con esto estoy un poco retrasado, uh, pero espero que la presentación ha sido interesante y uh, uh, os dejo con tres. Uh, URLs, que tienes el QR code. Espero veros al Open Source uh, in Finance Forum en uh, diciembre. Uh, si tenéis 15 minutos este verano, uh, uh, por favor, que, que, que nos hagan favor a, a, a completar el State of Open Source in Financial Services Survey. Y espero muchísimo veros en nuestra comunidad, en Finos. Muchísimas gracias por la oportunidad de compartir con vosotros. Gracias. Thank you so much, Gab, for that insightful talk. Next, we have our final speaker of the day, Arpit Jashapura, who's general manager of networking, IoT, and edge at the Linux Foundation. Arpit is an executive leader and open source software evangelist across carriers, cloud, and enterprise IT. Today, Arpit will be talking about how global telecom and cloud operators are leveraging the power of open source in 5G, Edge, and IoT. Please welcome Arpit Joshapura. Good morning. Um, I'm excited to join you all virtually at the Open Source Summit LATAM, uh, and especially excited to present the world of 5G edge and IoT, and how open source has really enabled that entire market to move forward. As you may have guessed, I head up all of the open source networking edge and IoT at the Linux Foundation. But what I'm going to talk about today are three important things. The first thing is how telecom edge computing are moving entirely to open source. And it's open source software, open interoperability, open deployments, etc. cetera. Um, I'm gonna focus on two very important things that you may wanna note down for 2022, the rest of 2022, um, in the world of kind of re-aggregation and security for open source. So we'll, we'll cover that. And then finally, uh, I'll cover the, um, uh, the next three years where we are heading in terms of technology. So let's start off by saying that telecommunications, you know, 5G, et cetera, and edge compute, they're being built on open source software in the global new world. Very important because we had published a white paper a couple of years ago, which again, by the way, will be refreshed this year, um, where we look at, looked at all the vertical industries, whether it's telecommunications, motion pictures, fintech, banks, public health, energy, et cetera. And we looked at the driving forces behind these industries moving to an open source software, specifically around end user driven innovation, faster deployments, uh, time to market and cost. Uh, obviously these are all a hundred plus year old industries. So these are not new, all of them are. And we are really excited that we in the telecommunications networking and edge space, we're leading that from the front using open source software. I call it open source application. If you zoom in just on the telecommunications and networking industry, the last decade was all around building blocks of technology that allowed us to separate hardware from software. NFV, network function virtualization, software defined networking, orchestration, right? Things like that. And the move to cloud native computing, cloud native networking. They were all part and parcel of where the telecommunications market uh, went. The next decade, 
is going to be about using open source connectivity and putting vertical markets to work, taking advantage, whether it's manufacturing, retail, oil and gas, healthcare. How do you utilize the power of connectivity in an open manner, whether it's edge deployed, whether it's intent based, whether it's AI enabled? So that's kind of a very, very high view of our vision and where things are heading. And we at the Linux Foundation are here to just encourage and accelerate the transition from a proprietary closed system to an open innovation ecosystem. The deployments started three to five years ago and they have been accelerating globally. Now you will see that LATAM is just picking up. But I'll show you some global headlines, whether it's Deutsche Telekom, AT&T, China Mobile, Orange, or if you look at America specifically, uh, vendors, right, um, or, and end users, AT&T, Intel, cloud is now moving very closely with the telecommunication systems and, and aligning the uh, cloud native solutions for, for 5G. So effectively, America's was leading the way. APAC was right behind. Uh, it was ahead in some instances, specifically as it comes to 5G uh, end user care, but the deployment has really started up big time, whether it's Japan, China, Korea, or anywhere in the APAC. Uh, spectrums have been released in India as well now, so 5G is now going to be big. And then EMEA, uh, Orange, they have deployed uh, the network. Deutsche Telekom has built an Orange town based on open source um, projects. Um, ORAN, another radio access network technology. So I don't want to go into everything, but the reality is open source is making headlines and it is really a very powerful tool to speed up interoperability and deployments. And then comes 5G. 5G is where connectivity rules. And it's no longer about the YouTubes and the mobile data. It's about things. It is what is classified as the framework for Industry 4 dial. It's millions and millions of things that need to be installed, brought up, managed, connected, um, and deployed. And, and the pricing has to be quite close to Wi-Fi. And so it's more complex. And the only way to scale is and, and have the economy of scale is through open source. If you look at the slides and you may not be very clear, uh, but subscriptions have gone up, network coverage has gone up, phone sales have gone up, access has gone up, private network deployments have gone up, uh, new set of uh, applications, AR, VR, simulations, they've all gone up. And then usage, data usage, ARPU, et cetera, have gone up. So that's you know from strategy analytics. But the implications are to all verticals, not just the end users like you and me who are just doing phones or mobile broadband. There's new revenue, there's new automation, there's new cost savings, there's new applications. And what we have seen so far is the top two use cases are IoT, so connected things, and private networks. And I'll talk a little bit about that on how we're enabling that. So if we zoom into LATAM, um, huge revenue, $82 billion, right, this year. Uh, and coming into next year. So significant growth. And it's on the heels of adoption of America. So that's great news. Um, the other great news is open source is a key enabler. And for operators and vendors and, and players within LATAM who, have not, who are not participating in Linux Foundation networking programs, you're missing out because huge revenue is at stake. There's huge economic value smartphone, mobile traffic, whether it's consumption. Uh, I have a list of example operators. You know, we already see that, you know, AT&T here is built on, uh, the entire AT&T network is built on multiple blocks of open source. Verizon is built on open source. Tim, uh, who is, who is uh, Tim Brazil here, but uh, Tim Italy has done a great experiment and, and deployed things on on open source and of course Telecaponica is one of the leaders in open source. So clearly you can see that the uh, incumbent uh, operators are now going to utilize the power of open and move forward with 5G. 
Uh, one example that I want to call out is Globo.com in LATAM has been with the Linux Foundation for quite some time, and they have been deploying one of our other projects for size, flexibility, APIs, cost reduction, etc. Uh, really, really, you know, very good examples of leaders in your region. So with that market background, I want to hit on two very important priorities for 2022. What is the world and the developers in the world trying to solve? They're trying to solve what's called re-aggregation and they're trying to solve what's called open source security. For the technical technology minded, the last 10 years was spent on what's called disaggregation. So disaggregation meaning separating hardware from software, separating control plane from data plane, you know, et cetera. Uh, and now you got to put it all together because, you know, when projects kind of separate out, you get the innovation and scale, and now you have to put it into an end-to-end -end solution with much faster innovation cycles. That's re-aggregation, and we'll get into security in a bit. So how do you re-aggregate in an open world? Well, you do it through use cases. Whether they are use cases in the enterprise world, whether it's private 5G workloads across multiple clouds, um, or in the service providers, including cloud service providers, or it's in the end users like government. The US government DARPA Ops 5G project is extremely dependent on open source LF networking uh, for their end-to-end -end, uh, super blueprints. We'll talk about that in a bit. But as these use cases develop, they are utilized and modified by the vertical edge markets, industrial energy, oil and gas, housing, automotive, et cetera, et cetera. And the logos below are a whole bunch of projects that allow you to bring things together, bring value, bring features, and bring that speed of open source software together. So let's go through you know, how this is gonna happen. Uh, but before we do that, I wanna call out another interesting phenomenon and that's edge compute. Edge compute in a simple manner is bringing the public cloud data center type resources close to you. Storage, server, and network close to you. And when you bring it close, and when I say close, both physically, geographically, but more importantly, from a latency perspective, get it down to 20 milliseconds. When edge compute is hot, digital transformation goes really fast. So I don't expect you to read the slides, but on the left-hand side is a, on the y-axis is a set of industries, ICT sector, finance, wholesale, manufacturing, oil and gas, et cetera. And on the top is assets, usage, and labor, right? The various, various attributes of digital transformation. Where you see green is where edge compute is really picking up. And that's what's causing the digital transformation to accelerate. So we're really excited about edge computing phenomena, and we are really Happy to host a huge project called LF Edge here, which I'll talk about in just a bit. So how do you bring it all together in an end-to-end -end world and re-aggregate these projects? Going from left to right, this is a architecture that we always use. These are some examples of some very important projects that make up networking and edge. Coming in on the left-hand side of the slide, it's mobile networks, residential, small, medium business, enterprise data centers. You come in into a user edge or a service provider edge, and we'll get more details into that, through some version of public cloud into the core, uh, up the stack, whether it's a network operating system, like a Dent or a Sonic, up into Kubernetes, DPDK, uh, eBPF, up all the way into ONAP, Magma, Leaf, et cetera. So you can see that these are projects, each of them are solving particular use cases in particular domain, and allowing um, an end-to-end -end solution to be built, okay? So let's first, before we get into the solution, define the edge compute market. <clears throat> A lot of people have said, oh, it's thin edge, thick edge, far edge, near edge. <clears throat> All those are relative terms. You don't want to do that. LF Edge, through its project, State of the Edge, has defined what's called Wikipedia-style definition of an edge. There's only two types of edges a user edge, which is dedicated in the control of user and a service provider edge, which is shared. And as a service and the last mile separates it. The implementations of user edge is not one, it's three. 
all the way from the left, constrained device edge. So microcontrollers, embedded compute, et cetera, to smart device edge, which is like IoT gateway types, to data center um, edges where you can actually put the resources in a secure location, still operated and in the control of a user. And then if you go into the access edge, you know, below a base station or in a smart central office, you have a shared resource that you can use as edge compute. Anything after that, more than 20 milliseconds. So it's not called edge from a latency perspective. But then if you look at the top, from infrastructure to applications, we have over 10 projects under what's called a sub foundation called LF edge in various stages. And, you know, they're very, very, important to bring and unify edge compute across multiple markets, whether it's a telecom edge, uh, tel uh, telecom edge, uh, IoT edge, enterprise edge, or cloud edge. So how do you unify them? You unify them using blueprints. So Crano is a project within LF edge. I'm just giving you an example here of how uh, these use cases have been implemented in a release, tested, interoperable, uh, and, and documented, right? So if someone wants to test cloud gaming, there's a blueprint for cloud gaming. If someone wants to test smart cities or vehicular prediction or IoT predictive maintenance, you can do all that. There's almost 20 blueprints that go in the Acrano project that solve specific use cases in edge computing. The other important part of re-aggregation is the unification of, or harmonization as we call it, of open source foundations, standards, and alliances. As we all know, the world of networking and edge is always, you know, for 100 plus years, it's heavily standardized. And what we wanna do is work very closely with the standards bodies and get implementation in open source as quickly as possible so that we can turn around standards and change code as quickly as possible. And we are pleased to say, you know, Linux Foundation networking has been leading the way, whether it's partnerships with Etsy, GSMA, 3GPP, ORAN, TMF, MEF, and GMN, or uh, partnerships with alliances uh, in all verticals or partnerships with other open source foundations. And collaboration has significantly increased in 2022, and we're really excited about that. Uh, but that's an important component because you want standards and open source deployment to go hand in hand, okay? I won't go into the ex examples of each of these standards, so I'm gonna skip that for a moment. Uh, there are specific Etsy standards or GSMA standards or, or uh, any of these that have been implemented in code that align. So an end user like yourself don't need to worry about whether open source software uh, standard is standard based or not, okay? And so with that background on re-aggregation, what happens? The projects need to come into products that need to come into deployments. And so we are trying to, uh, in an open world, do something called a blueprint or a super blueprint. And that could mean open compliance and verification, open interop and testing, and open training. So the community comes together and chips in um, and helps out and releases the documentation for these use cases for people to, to deploy, enhance, and uh, take advantage of. Keep in mind, this is the undifferentiated part of the software subsystem. So how do you make the solution? This is how you do it. And I'm gonna pause a little bit because there's a lot of logos here, but it's the same slide. User edge, service provider edge, and cloud and core. All these projects, they all come together in what's called 5G Super Blueprint. 5G Super Blueprint is a great initiative by LF Networking, and it brings multiple sub foundations, cloud native, LF Edge, LF Networking, Magma, ORAN, you name it, all together into a solution that can solve use cases. And the world is heavily dependent on this, right? So for LATAM particularly, I believe that these blueprints are the fastest way for a service provider to take advantage of the 5G innovation and deployment, uh, which comes pre-integrated, pre-tested, pre-interop, right? So whether you are borrowing equipment or you're buying equipment from our classic vendors, 
Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, ZT, Samsung, etc., uh, Cisco, Juniper, IBM, you know, whatever, or you're building your own with other people, it comes pre-packaged, pre-integrated. And here's the details of the architecture, which I'm going to skip for sure in the keynote. But you can rest assured that there's real labs, real software that comes out of a FlyG blueprint, and there are real uh, examples of that. <clears throat> the other thing I want to emphasize is why are these projects growing? And they're growing because people see value. These are just examples of projects that have seen significant growth over the last three years. And I won't go into the growth, but they are, and this is just contributor strength and, um, you know, across all these projects. <clears throat> so where are we heading? Um, number two in 2022, and that's security. We have done multiple surveys for open source security, research with Harvard, and the research points to very simple things. Everybody wants open source. They're concerned about open source and only half of them are ready. The second research has pointed out that it's just not enough to fix vulnerability. That's important, but you need to manage security from an entire life cycle perspective. Packaging, integration, SBOM, software builder material, all of those things are very important. You need to know where the code is coming from and you need to do it for top projects that are part of your critical infrastructure. I'm not gonna ask you a show of hands on who believe that uh, uh, you know, 5G and connectivity is critical infrastructure. Otherwise, you, know, you won't even be listening to me without connectivity. So we are in a very important critical infrastructure project. And so open source supply chain has six actions that Linux foundation wide projects are implementing. Secure the critical component, automate tooling, deliver the training, secure the factories, the build materials, the S bombs, and try and research even more. And we're pleased to report that LF networking and edge are leading the way. These are just snapshots of how we are progressing from uh, our, our tools that track this security.lfx.linux foundation. And you can search on individual projects like ONAP or Open Daylight, or you can search across LF networking. Very, very good progress. And if you want to need more detail on how security has been managed, read the, download the white paper on our website. The key here is open source is more secure and it is faster to innovate. And that's kind of the main reason why governments worldwide, as well as telecommunications and service providers worldwide are using open source. So finally, let me tell you where we are heading the next one to three years. We're heading in a world where we're gonna complete the end-to-end -end open puzzle. Markets and architectures are coming together. The world of cloud enterprise and telecom, which used to be completely separate, is all unifying. We are asking the community to align project ambition, harmonize where possible. We are opening up uh, the Linux Foundation for new projects, which complement projects and build the missing pieces. And whether it's intent-based automation, applicable, uh, application aware networking or edge compute, it doesn't matter. And you wanna do all of the plumbing work, if you may, before 6G hits. 6G is going to be even bigger. And I know it's like, why is Arpit talking about 6G when 5G is not yet there? But again, next 10 years, we have to be ready from an infrastructure perspective. Huge data rates, huge device scales. I don't even want to speculate here on what latency, reliability, and, 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 and it's going to be a sensor world, right? It's going to be a trusted social world where, uh, you know, metaverse is dominant, right? A virtual world. Um, and you know, it's up to us to figure out what use cases are important. Uh, we have a lot of global uh, organizations and initiatives that are identifying the use cases for 6G. Uh, here's some example from, uh, from China IMT vision, right? Whether it's immersive experiences, sensory uh, or, or any of the uh, seamless coverages. 
And so with that background, I want to alert all of you that there is implications and there is implications on all of you. The implication on foundations like us is we need to increase community participation and, and make sure there's center of gravity and not all open sources are created equal, right? You can't just have a code on GitHub and say, hey, this is the one. You want to be community driven. You want an ecosystem around it. That, so that's our implication. The projects has to you know, look for diversity. They have to look for value. They will do align to standards. For people like you who are network admins, get trained. DevOps is the next new thing. You know, there is tooling that Linux Foundation has in terms of skill sets on how to move from Del Dev uh, NetOps to DevOps, right? Learn, learn to do these things because things are changing very, very quickly. And then the biggest impact is on vendors and system integrators, which is the future world is no longer about proprietary, where you can put out an RFP and buy from one or two vendors, take 18 months to deploy and then be happy because CapEx are under pressure, OpEx are under pressure, and more importantly, the speed of innovation is huge because of the CI CD benefits that you get from open source. Okay. So participate, learn how these projects are coming together um, and join the revolution. And if you are interested in traveling, uh, we have a our largest open networking and edge summit or one summit as we call it in North America on November 15th and 16th in Seattle. It's, it's kind of where where some of the biggest minds and biggest developers and the smartest people will be there. So if you are, if you are willing to, do come. Um, with that, I am going to wrap up. You can check the, the videos and you can, you know, feel free to communicate with us through the wiki. And thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak here. Bye-bye. There's a lot going on in the space, and thank you so much, Arpit, for telling us all about it. That now concludes our keynotes for the day, and we're about to have a break. So I encourage everyone to grab a coffee, get a snack, and then come back here and meet us at 11 a.m. Eastern time for breakouts. Don't forget to visit our sponsor booths. They open today, and we'll be here throughout the event. Also, make sure to join the topic-based lounges in the lobby or the lobby chat um, where you'll be able to connect with other attendees. If you run into any technical issues today, please reach out to the help desk channel or Slack in the lobby chat on the event platform. We are here for anything you need. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a fantastic day and we'll see you back here for keynotes tomorrow.